हेलो एवरीबॉडी दिस इज डॉक्टर विशाल त्रिवेदी फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायोसाइंसेज एंड बायो इंजीनियरिंग आई आई टी गुवाहाटी एंड द कोर्स एक्सपेरिमेंटल बायोटेक्नोलॉजी इज मोर अबाउट द एक्सपेरिमेंट व्हाट यू आर गोइंग टू परफॉर्म इन योर लेबोरेटरी और व्हाट यू आर गोइंग टू परफॉर्म इन योर लेबोरेटरी सो बिफोर यू इंटर इन टू एनी लेबोरेटरी यू हैव टू फॉलो द सर्टन रूल्स एंड रेगुलेशन एंड एज वेल एज यू हैव टू फॉलो द गाइडलाइन जस्ट लाइक वेन यू स्टार्ट रन Uh, learning the motor car or any scooter and you want to run it on the uh, road you have to follow the uh, rules of the road and you have to follow all the traffic uh, signals you have to understand what are those things and and similarly uh, when you enter into a experimental lab whether it is a lab for your school lab or whether it is a lab for the research purposes you have to follow the certain guidelines and all these guidelines are coming under the purview of good lab practices so the good lab practices are the set of guidelines what a person has to follow when he will going to perform the experiments in a laboratory and as per the definition is concerned the good lab practices are the practices which are actually embodies a set of principle that provides a framework within which the laboratory studies are planned performed monitored recorded reported and archived which means the good lab practices are the set of the guidelines uh which actually are going to follow by everybody when you are going to plan the experiments what are the different information you require what are the different biohazards you are going to generate and what are the outcomes of that particular experiment so it is not important that you are doing an experiment it is also important that you should do the experiment uh, under the Uh, certain guidelines so that the results what you are going to come out from the uh, experiments are actually be reproducible and the, the 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 documentation is also going to be in a perfect shape so that the other people also could be able to follow the experiments could be able to replicate in their labs and that is all under comes under the uh, purview of the good lab practices the question comes why there is a need for good lab practices so in the beginning of the uh, 19th centuries the people were not following a good lab practices and as a result they were actually not uh, documenting the procedures they are not documenting the data they were not documenting the results properly and because the uh, the 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 scientific community wants to replicate those experiments it was very difficult to replicate because the minute experimental details were missing in some cases it was very very uh, problematic because you can imagine that there is a biopharma company who is actually uh, producing a medicine or who is developing a medicine this medicine could be for the cure of cancer and all other kind of thing and they are claiming something like they are claiming that this particular medicine is going to cure the cancer patients but the data what they are providing uh, cannot be verified until they are not going to tell you the procedure so realizing this fact the food and drug administration of the uh, united states of america realize that people are doing the mal practices people are not uh, reporting the acute uh, total procedures and as a result they said that they are, we we actually require a set of guidelines we have to and that these guidelines has to be followed by all over the world so that the uh, the scientific community are going to perform the experiments with the set of uh, rules and regulations and as a result uh, you can be able to Uh, perform these experiments you can be able to reproduce these ex results and that's how it is actually going to bring more and more transparency so for this purpose the food and drug administrations are actually formulated the international economic organization the organizations for the economic cooperation and development that is oecd and the oecd is the organization which publishes the principles of glp in 1981 under the name oecd guidelines for the testing of chemicals that were internationally required 
I have given you the link which you can actually follow to understand and read the complete guidelines about this particular uh, the OECD guidelines what you have to follow. I am only going to give you a summary of some of these uh, guidelines what you should follow when you enter into a, a, a research lab or to the your school lab so that you should be able to protect yourself while you are doing this experiment. On the other hand whatever the data you generate could be based on the scientific principles that could be reproduced by the other scientific community and it should uh, at the end going to help the, uh, the human society. So, there are guidelines which are recommended that you should follow this and there are the guidelines that you that says that you should not do this when you are inside the lab. So, let us see what are the recommended actions. So, in the recommended actions you always when you enter into a lab you always wear the appropriate equipment of the personal protections they include an apron, a pair of gloves, safety glasses and the shoes. So, what you see is that in the lab you actually uses the two different types of gloves one is called as the latex gloves these latex gloves are only to protect or to protect you from the getting exposure to the chemicals or to getting the exposure to the uh, some kind of dust and all other kind of material what you are generating in your laboratory. Apart from that these are the uh, rubber uh, gloves which people normally use when they are actually handling the hot uh, liquids like uh, suppose you are boiling a, uh, a solution into the microwave and you want to take out. So, these are the microwave gloves. Apart from that you always should wear the apparents because the purpose of wearing the apparent is that if in case there will be any spillage from the chemical reactions or if there will be any spillage from the uh, for example, if you are growing a bacteria which is infectious and if you are getting some spillage from the flask that spillage is not going to get into your own uh, clothes. So, the app wearing an apparent is actually going to protect you from getting the exposure to the infectious or uh, these organism as well as getting the exposure to the direct exposure of the chemicals. So, if you wear the apparent, apparent is made up of, of uh, thick uh, cotton uh, uh, cloth. So, it actually gain kind of a first layer of protections that it, sh it should you should not get ex directly exposed to the chemical as well as the infectious organisms. Apart from that you also have to wear the safety glasses. The safety glasses are uh, mostly being used in chemistry laboratories where uh, it actually protects your eyes because when you are doing some reactions and you do not know what kind of the uh, byproducts are going to be generated or what are the products are going to be generated. So, uh, when you are doing a reaction which is unknown or which is a newly you know you are doing something. So, in that cases uh, you have to protect your eyes. So, you can use a safety glasses and these safety glasses are actually going to protect you. Apart from that you can also use the shield. So, shield is actually uh, a kind of a you know uh, 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 face shield. So, that face shield is actually also going to protect you from the uh, getting the um, you know uh, any kind of spillage onto the face. For example, if uh, this face shield are also being used very routinely in the uh, hospitals uh, or other kind of uh, experimental labs where you expect a spillage of the chemicals or the biological waste. So, in those cases uh, it actually will not going to go, go into your face and it is actually going to protect your uh, body. Apart from that if you are working with a, a radioactive material then you also should use the radioactive shields. So, in the radioactivity when you are working on a radioactive um, uh, chemicals like if you are working with the tissue or you are working with the uh, P32 uh, labeled ATP. Uh, then you have to use the lead uh, wall. So, in the lead wall what you have is you are actually having the bricks which are made up of, of thick uh, lead bricks and these bricks has to be kept in front of you as a wall and then you are going to perform the experiment across the wall. So, uh, the idea is that the, the any kind of radiation what is coming from the radioactive material is going to be uh, you know going to be stopped or going to be blocked by the, uh, the these lead um, bricks and that is how it actually not going to protect your body it is not going to expose your body. Apart from that you also have to wear 
with the these radioactive batches the purpose of these radioactive batches is that when you wear these they actually are going to count how much radiation you are getting so when you are actually working with the radioactive material especially like p32 or the tcm the 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 beta count beta particles what is coming from these materials are actually going to be exchanged by these uh, batches and then they are actually going to keep a count how many how many beta uh, uh, how much radiation you are getting because it is not recommended that you get exposed too much to these uh, radiation so uh, uh, so in a timely manner you have to send these patches to the uh, some of the radioactive uh, agencies and what they will do is they are going to count how much is the radioactive count present in that particular batch and if that count is beyond a limit then they will ask you to remain away from the lab or at least not to perform the any experiment with the radioactivity because then actually it is going to be the life threatening so to monitor the health of the person who is performing the experiment with the radioactivity you always have to wear these radioactive batches so that they while you are performing the experiments since because you know most of these radioactive uh, radiations you cannot be able to see so that's why these batches are actually going to tell you that how much your body is uh, receiving the radioactive uh, radiations and uh, once it is reaching once it is crossing a particular limit then they will ask you to wait and rest because uh, once you receive the radiations the cells are going to die off and then actually your radioactivity count is going to go down so then you can wait uh, wait for some time and then you you are ready to work again but during th th this information only you will get when you wear these radioactive batches before you plan the experiment you have to read the procedures very thoroughly so that you will be able to know at what procedure you require and what are the equipments are required then before starting the experiment you have to label your material for example if you are using the appendoffs or falcons or beakers all these material has to be labeled so that there will be no mismatch there will be no uh, like uh, you know that you will you will not label the things and then you forget and then you are actually going to report that i have added x material but instead you have added actually the y material so when the people will try to reproduce or will try to rep replicate they will not be able to replicate and your documentation is also going to be very very compromised uh after that you have to check the label of the container before using uh, that container from the substance because if the material is hygroscopic you have to maintain the low moisture so you have to use it very carefully and then uh, close the container if it is a uh, hazardous material or if it is a carcinogenic material then also you have to take the proper precautions you have to wear the gloves you have to uh, take the full uh, precautions or if it is a uh, material which evaporates like uh, so in those cases you have to take the appropriate uh, precautions apart from that uh, you also have to be aware the location and the operating procedure of the safety equipments so you are going to use the safety showers first aid kits fire extinguishers and the eye wash before you start the experiment before you enter into a laboratory you also should know where are the safety uh, equipments are being kept in the department so that whenever there will be any such accident occurs you should know where i should go and uh, use the particular type of equipments what are the equipment you have you have the safety showers so the safety showers are like the normal shower what you have in your home and the purpose of the safety shower is only to wash away the chemicals what is being spilled onto your body or suppose sometime you all got the uh, small uh, fire hazard or something you know your uh, clothes have catched the fire in those cases beneath the uh, safety shower and actually you it, it is actually going to remove the chemicals apart from that you can also have the first aid kits in case you have got some minor injury or minor accidents then you can have the different types of bandages and all those kind of things so that also is required when you are lab working in a laboratory so that in case there is a minor accident or minor injury you can be able to take care of that apart from that you also require the fire extinguishers 
so that actually is and uh, required to you know the to uh, extinguish the fires and it is not important that you should know the, the locations of those equipments, you also should know uh, the, how to operate these equipments because when there is a fire you have you might not have the uh, pro professional people to help you in that case you might have to operate these equipment yourself and apart from that you also require the eye wash. So, eye wash is a is a is a equipment which actually you can use in in case um, there, is, there is a spillage of the chemicals in your eyes in that case you cannot use the uh, these the showers you can easily use the uh, eye washes to wash your eyes and that actually is going to remove the level of chemicals in your eyes and probably can uh, help you in terms of getting the recovery very soon uh, you have to use a chemical hood for strong acids and other the other fuming chemicals and solvents. So, for most of the chemistry labs what they are using is they are using very strong acid and strong bases or some of the chemicals which are actually evaporatory. So, in those all it is like organic solvents and all those kind of so all that you have to use a fume hood because the fume hood is actually going to suck all these fumes and that is how they are actually not the person who is using them will not get exposed. Uh, apart from that when you are working in a biology lab you are going to use recommended biosafety containment while handling the microorganisms. So, let us understand what are the different biosafety levels. So, biosafety levels according to the biosafety level you have to handle a particular microorganisms. There are four biosafety levels in a particular uh, laboratory or in a uh, and these the biosafety levels are being classified based on the low risk microorganisms versus the high risk microorganisms. So, you have the B, uh, BSL, uh, BSL 1, BSL 2, BSL 3 and BSL 4. Let us understand what is mean by BSL 1. So, the BSL 1 category is actually uh, are the those organisms which does not cause any disease in healthy individuals, uh, minimum potential hazard to the laboratory personnel and the environment. The classical example is the E. coli which means in the BSL 1 facility or BSL 1 the microorganism which falls under the BSL 1 does not cause any disease to a healthy individual. If you are immunocompromised or if you are having any kind of other diseases then probably these microorganism may cause a disease, but for a healthy individual these microorganism will not cause any disease. One of the classical example is E. coli. Uh, then you have the BSL 2, in the BSL 2 you have the moderate potential hazard to the laboratory personnel and the environment, difficult to contact via aerosol in the lab setting. One of the classical example is the hepatitis A, B, C, influenza and the Lyme disease. So, the BSL-2 uh, organisms are also very moderate. In some cases, they may cause the disease, but these disease are not life threatening. These disease could be cured simply by giving some medicines or they are actually manageable. Uh, you, uh, the major, major uh, thing which is actually not the contaminant, so the BSL-2 organisms will not get uh, contaminate you by the forming the aerosol which means they are not airborne organisms, you will, you will get in, in exposure only if there will be a spillage and you will get a direct contact to these microorganisms. Uh, classical example is the hepatitis, the influenza as well as the Lyme disease. Then you have the BSL-3, the BSL-3 organisms are the organism which can cause serious or potential lethal diseases through respiratory transmissions. Examples are HIV, H1N1 flu, tuberculosis, SARS, rabies, western Nile viruses. So, the BSL-3 facility uh, organisms are the organism which actually can cause very serious disease or life threatening diseases. They also get spread through aerosol. So, that is why they are very very infectious and they, you have to protect yourself from these microorganisms. The classical examples are the HIV, H1 flu, tuberculosis, SARS and that is why you have to use the appropriate uh, biosafety cabinets or the uh, other kind of equipments to protect yourself. Then you have the BSL-4. In the BSL-4, you have the dangerous and the exotic posing high risk of the aerosol transmitted infections. 
इन्फेक्शंस कॉज बाई दीज माइक्रो ऑर्गेजम आर फैटल एंड विदाउट ट्रीटमेंट और द वैक्सीन वन ऑफ द क्लासिकल एग्जाम्पल इज द इबोला और द स्मॉल फॉक्स सो बी एस एल फोर इज द कैटेगरी ऑफ द माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिज्म वेयर विच एक्चुअली कॉज द फैटल डिजीजेज एंड दे आर एक्चुअली आर लाइफ थर्टेनिंग सो इन दिस केसेज द वन ऑफ द क्लासिकल एग्जाम्पल इज द इबोला और द स्मॉल पॉक्स so all these uh, biosafety levels are actually being used to classify the different microorganisms so that you will be able to buy the uh, the particular type of equipments while you are handling these microorganisms if you are using the bsl1 and bsl2 you can be able to use them or monitor them or manipulate them within the laminar hood or the biosafety cabinets whereas for the bsl3 and bsl4 you require the not only the biosafety cabinet but you also require a negative pressure room so that you will be able to manage these microorganism not infecting the personal who is using that and what is mean by the negative pressure is that you are actually going to suck the air from the uh, from the room and then you are actually going to burn these air so that whatever the material comes out from these rooms are actually going to be burned at a very high temperature and you are that's how you are actually going to destroy all the microorganism or the aerosol what is being generated within these rooms apart from that you have to decontaminate your workbench and the equipment handled after use which means when you once you are once you are done with the experiments suppose you are using the bacteria or other things then you should decontaminate your pipettes you should decontaminate your hands and you can decontaminate your workbench as well uh, decontaminate all the infectious material before disposing them off so when before you throw the bacteria or viruses or any other thing you have to ensure that they are being disposed they are being sterilized and they that so that they will not cause any potential hazard to the environment uh, in any case when you have any spillage accident or the injury you should directly report that to your lab supervisor or to the lab instructors because it is important that the person who is more qualified and the person who have handled such situation should be informed so that he knows how to Uh, how to cover up how to take care of the spillage because if you have done the radioactive spillage the procedure is different if you have done the acid spillage the procedure is different and and so on so the procedure is required a proper protocol has to be followed if you have done the radioactive spillage or any other kind of spillages but that's why it is important that if you have any such accident like fire accident spillage all that has to be reported to your instructor or to the supervisor and as i said you know do decontaminate all the infectious material before you dispose them off into the uh, into the, uh, the proper dust bins or the trash can you can have the three step of sanitizations you can have the sanitization you can have disinfections and then you can have the sterilizations in the sanitization you are going to do the surface clean and you are going to reduce the microbial microbial load Uh, that you can do simply by the common solution for routine cleaning for example the you can use a mild cleaning agent such as the soap or the household detergent and that actually is going to sanitize the material or sanitize the surfaces and that is good enough for reducing the load of the microbial load and uh, you can add some material which also may have the little antimicrobial activity uh, then you can do a disinfection disinfection means you are going to kill the microorganism so the microorganism on the surface are being killed inactivated and made harmless the solution for the simple cases of contaminations you can use the quaternary ammonium compound which are antimicrobial properties they do not corrode the metal or the damage the plastics and then you have the third step which is actually the sterilizations sterilization means the total removal of any contaminations no viable microbes remain uh, this is reserved for the serious contaminations you can use the oxidizing agent such as bleach or the hydrogen peroxide stick to the safety rules and don't use this agent on the plastic or to the metal surfaces so you have the three different options depending on what kind of uh, 
the spillage you have done, if you can do sanitization, you can do disinfection, you can do the sterilizations. Because if the material, if the bio, uh, if the microbes what you are using is, uh, is falling into the category of BSL 1 and 2, you can do sanitization and disinfections. But if you are working with the uh, uh, microorganism which is falling under the category of BSL number 3 and 4, then you have to do the sterilization so that the microorganism what you have spilled should be get killed and it should be removed from the surfaces otherwise it because it is a air, airborne and it can actually cause the fatal diseases it will be problematic for the person who is going to get exposed. Uh, and and as, I, as I said you have to report all the spillages accident and injury uh, to your instructor or to the lab supervisors. Uh, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here thank you.